We are now probably seeing the end of world population growth in the uh, second half of this century. That's just a simple measure of age. Now people are working longer. They're also being more productive. For China, the good news is the overall productivity uh, is likely to increase and economic growth uh, can continue. If you go to a, a Swedish company even there, there is no uh, meeting scheduled after 3 p.m. And this turns out to be both productive for the economy as well as leading to higher birth rates. Hi, everyone. This is Randy Shu with the Lohan Academy. And I have the uh, extreme privilege today of uh, welcoming back uh, Professor Wolfgang Lutz uh, with us today. Um, and uh, Professor Lutz is a um, you know very renowned uh, Austrian demographer uh, specializing in population and demographic analysis. Um, he uh, heads up and founded the uh, Wittgenstein Center for Demogra uh, Demography and Global Human Capital. Um, and that's a collaboration between IIASA uh, and the Vienna Institute of Demography uh, of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Um, and he also uh, holds a professorship at Vienna University, uh, as well as having um, an appointment at the Oxford Martin School. Uh, so, uh, you know, Professor Lutz has way too many, <laughs> you know, academic publications. I think this number may be outdated, but I think it was something like um, over 270 uh, in, in one bio of you and 13 in Nature and Science. So we're very, very privileged to have you with us today. And I want to really start off and um, follow up on, you know, you came to our Frontier Dialogue to talk about your views on aging. So, um, you know, recently in the news, China's population has been in the news recently, particularly the fact that, you know, China saw a decline in the official kind population. So I really um, wanted to kind of ask you some questions about this. You had sent over a paper that you had written. So I was wondering if you can talk about your views towards um, China's population projections going forward and um, how your views might differ from, um, you know, some of the voices we're hearing. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, listing some of the affiliations I have. Maybe I should add that at the moment, I'm also uh, acting as uh, Deputy Director General for Science of an International Research Institute, YASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, uh, with many national academies around the world being the members and China also being an important member country of our institute. At YASA, we really uh, not try to focus on the rather narrow specific topics, but as the name says, systems, you think in a more systemic uh, met manner. So this means that we try uh, to see how, for instance, the demographic changes interact with economic changes, with environmental changes. So we do a lot of analysis of population and climate change or population and economic development. So we tend to see uh, these issues and particularly the longer term trends and, and demographic shifts are a longer term trend in the context uh, of the overall development of countries and uh, the planet as a whole. Now, when it comes to uh, demography, uh, this is really a, a process of, uh, of deep changes that most countries of the world have experienced or are in the process of experiencing that we call the demographic transition. So at an early stage uh, in Europe, this was before 1900 and in Asia, in most parts, this was before 1950. Uh, there have been uh, sort of what we say uncontrolled fertility and mortality. So the death rates were rather high. And at the same time, the birth rates were rather high. And then as uh, the development uh, went on, uh, the technology improved, people were better educated. We see that first uh, the death rates start to fall, including the fall of child mortality, which is usually the first thing to fall because it's easiest uh, to influence. And then during a period when the death rates are already low, but the birth rates are still high because in, in traditional norms and traditional societies, people want to have many children because otherwise in the past, the societies would have died out. So there was a need to have many births in order to have the population survive. But there is an intermediate phase where the birth rate is high and the death rate is low, and that's where population grow very rapidly. 
In Europe, we had this at the beginning of the 20th century. And in many parts of Asia, including China, you had this in the 1960s and 1970s. And this was also the time when then the Chinese government uh, decided, well, this is uh, population growth is too rapid. We really have to make efforts to bring the birth rate down. And not only China, but other countries also had implemented family planning programs that uh, tried to bring down the birth rate in order to limit the population growth rate because there was also an understanding that the food supply would be an issue if the population increases too rapidly. Uh, some people may even die due to starvation. And of course, in China, as in many other countries, you have a, a history of, of people in the past uh, dying uh, of starvation because there was not enough food. So this is some of the bigger uh, background. Uh, but then what we've seen that uh, after a while, uh, not only due to these family planning programs, but in many countries that did not have explicit family planning programs, the birth rates also declined uh, because of particularly important was female education as women first become literate and then even get some secondary education or higher education, they tend to change their preferences. They don't want to have large numbers of children anymore, but rather have a few children and be able to invest more into the life of these children and uh, that's what economists call the quantity quality trade off. You want to have fewer children, uh, but children who will have a better life. And this is uh, happening all over the world. And that's why we see declines in the birth rate all over the world, even in Africa, which is sort of the latest world region entering this demographic transition. We see now in many countries that particularly the better educated women, they only want two or three children and they only, they only have, have two or three children. Well, what then happens uh, in Europe, uh, we've seen it and in many other Asian countries as well, uh, that the decline in the birth rate does not stop at the so-called replacement level fertility, which is two surviving children per woman. But once this process is in force in its way, it goes down to what we call a sub replacement fertility, meaning uh, less than two children uh, per woman. And here the question is, like, how low does it go? In Europe, we had seen some countries like Italy or other Mediterranean countries like Spain going down to 1.2, 1.3 children per woman on average, which is already very low. That's where you are at the moment also in, in China. There are some countries where it has gone even lower and then South Korea is an example for this. In South Korea, the birth rate really is down to 0 0.7 children per woman, which is of course extremely low. That means that one generation would not only be half, but it would be cut to, to one third as compared to the previous generation because it's only 0 0.7 children per woman. So the question is, this is an unexpected trend. In the past, demographers did not believe that the birth rates would go that low. And now we have to assess what are the economic consequences. But maybe I'll, I'll stop here after this analytical frame and you can then ask more specific questions about the economic consequences. Yeah, um, so, so, so I think, on the economic consequences, you seem to be uh, a little more optimistic or more sanguine, right? Um, because in, for example, in uh, this paper on China, you talk about how we really need to, uh, you know, there are different metrics we should use. Historically, the most simple one people often point to, I think the news often points to is the ADR. Um, and, the, you know, that's just a simple measure of age. Now people are working longer. They're also being more productive. So th there's different measures of it. And then you, you think this education is going to be uh, highly relevant, right? Uh, and you talk about this for other countries too. And looking at the cohorts, the, the you know, older people will be, or the next generation coming um, uh, will be more educated. But so I guess the question is, um, how, uh, what are, wh what is the good news economically in that? You know, people are more educated. They have more, uh, we have more technology coming out. And what is, Maybe the bad news, the, the fact that yeah. there's some things that maybe education technology can't make up for. 
Yes, well, thank you. These are very important questions. And again, these are questions that are relevant for most countries around the world, uh, because we are all going through this uh, demographic transition. And as a consequence of the birth rate being low and life expectancy is still increasing, and this is very good news that in, uh, despite of the COVID pandemic that had sort of seen a little uh, interruption of the increases in life expectancy, we now see in many countries that the earlier trajectory uh, is being resumed and we, we will have likely continued further increases in life expectancy in most countries. But this means that the populations on average are getting older. What does this mean? Well, uh, in the short to medium run, meaning that's like 20 years into the future, uh, lower birth rates are really essentially only good news. Uh, we have uh, fewer children and can invest more in each child. And there is less of what we call the uh, young age dependency burden. You just uh, pointed before at these so-called age dependency ratios. This is sort of the first approximation uh, where we have a changing age structure. You just see like how do the different age groups, let's say children and young people who are in education, let's say up to age 15 or 20, how big is that group? Then how many people there are at working age, which is let's say from 20 to 60, 64, depending on the pension system. And then how many people there are above age 65 and how these three big age groups, how they change their relative weights. And then, uh, of course, uh, the, the best uh, for economic growth is if the age group of people that uh, tend to be productive, that tend to be in the labor force uh, increases, that is good for economic growth. And uh, if fertility declines in the short run, the number of children, sort of the youth dependency will be declined. And the uh, proportion of the population in working ages is increasing. So even for this rather simplistic age specific, uh, view, uh, you have uh, for the coming decades uh, a boost uh, to economic growth to a decline in fertility. But of course, in the long run, you will then have a higher proportion of people above age 85, uh, 65, and of course, even uh, above age 80 and 85, the people who are typically in need uh, also for uh, more intensive care. Uh, this is something that will in the long run be a, a consequence of low fertility. So uh, this is just if you have a, only an age specific view, you have in the short run still a benefit. And then there will be a period that is neutral. And then in the long run, you will have an increasing burden due to aging. And that's what some people call this window of opportunity that uh, opens up for economic growth. But then after a few decades, uh, when the popular, the elderly population increases, it seems to close. But this is, of course, a very narrow view if you only look at the age. We know that people, uh, not all people have the same age. Let's say not all 25-year-old people are equally productive, and not even all of them are are working. There are uh, some people uh, retire earlier. Some women in many countries are not part of the formal labor force. They are uh, staying at home. So what we'll really have to look next is the actual labor force dependency. So how many people are working and how many people are not working? And this labor force dependency increases uh, slowly, more slowly uh, than the age dependency. But then again, labor force participation uh, doesn't give you the full picture because some working people are more productive than others. And their education is a key uh, determinant of the productivity of people. So uh, if you have higher skills uh, you, in the same time work, working, you can uh, produce more. So uh, what we've now developed is this uh, not only age and, and labor force, but also uh, productivity weighted labor force dependency ratio. And here for China, the good news is uh, that this will be increasing um, very slowly or possibly not at all in the coming decades because China has invested so much in the education of the young people and the people as they move up the age pyramid, better and better educated people will move into the working ages and therefore uh, the, the overall productivity uh, is likely to increase and economic growth uh, can continue to uh, be prevalent. And we'll see probably not at these very high rates that China has seen in the past. Most countries uh, uh, that are more mature have uh, growth rates maybe at uh, two, three, four percent per year rather than close to 10 percent. But still, there is a future of further growth. Okay. Now, um... 
you know, uh, so I guess one, one of the question is what problems, so let's say we have technologies and education that uh, give people more pro productivity. Are there, you know, still problems that arise from having a lower population? And then the second issue is, um, I, sorry, the, the, the second question related to that is, um, are there policies that have been more successful than others? in uh, trying to, um, you know, reverse population decline. Yes, I mean, you mentioned now the word population decline, which is a slightly uh, different issue than population aging. Uh, but of course, if the birth rates are very low, and if there is not uh, migration, uh, in migration to compensate uh, for the lower number of births, uh, then in the longer run, the population will actually decline in absolute size. In Europe, we have a quite different pattern. I mean, the fertility rates have been quite low in, in Western Europe. Germany, as an example, has been uh, projected to decline in its population size for many years, but it did not happen because so many migrants came to Germany, unexpected large numbers of migrants they came to Germany and therefore migration compensated for the lower birth rates, if you want. Uh, and, and how dangerous to economic growth, the changes in population size, uh, this is a very tricky question uh, that the, where the economists uh, don't fully agree. Some of them think that the size of the market overall uh, is of course important for economic growth. Uh, uh, but if you look at the welfare per person, sort of the GDP per capita, yeah. uh, then uh, it, it, it's not so clear. For instance, the European Union, we have been increasing the market uh, uh, through the expansion of the European Union. So the European, the countries themselves yeah. have been losing uh, population in part, but the European Union has still been growing because new countries joined the European Union and the market became larger in this way. So that's a separate issue. But if we look at the at the aging, of course, if aging is too extreme, uh, as we will likely see it in Korea or also in Japan, where also the birth rate now for many years has been just about half of the replacement a fertility level uh, there there may be issues in the care of elderly people uh, which um, uh, i mean uh, some of these uh, uh, activities of caring for elderly can be automated i mean japan is a world leader in robotics and, and much of the idea sort of cleaning elderly people with robots and, and so on uh, but still not all this can be done by machines and of course people also want other people to talk to the the elderly people want human beings to interact with and this is quite important also for their psychological well-being so there is a need uh, uh, of some workforce uh, to to look after the elderly and the and, and the question really is uh, to what extent the uh, yeah the improving skills uh, of the younger population uh, can uh, uh, cover the expenses uh, for uh, looking after the elderly and and also the the, the elderly uh, need to learn themselves through continued education so education should not only be concentrated at young age we need to do what is called the lifelong learning and and getting used uh, to new technologies and new uh, ways uh, of interacting with each other uh, throughout our lives. And, uh, and I think these will be strategies that can can help to cope with many of the challenges of, of population aging. Sure. Do, do you think there are, you know, from the countries that have had this problem earlier, do you think there are policies that are more effective at dealing with fertility, lower fertility? Uh, yes. I mean, in Europe, we have uh, quite interesting examples, sort of the the countries that have the uh, highest fertility in the in the European context uh, are the Nordic countries, Sweden, Finland, uh, Denmark, Norway, uh, as well as France. But France is uh, for different historical reasons. And uh, let's look at the, these Nordic countries because they are interesting. They are also the ones where uh, female empowerment is most developed, where women work almost to the same extent as men do. Uh, the education of women is uh, almost the same as it is uh, for men, and uh, these countries are very family friendly. Uh, sort of, they they really allow women to combine uh, a professional career uh, with uh, uh, being uh, able to have their own family and spend time with their children. 
And this is quite different from what you see in, in some um, East Asian countries, like in Korea, particularly, they, uh, they are, the government is aware of this fact uh, that there is a problem due to aging, uh, but they uh, like to sort of fight this by uh, forcing people, including women, to work even harder. I mean, the prime minister said you should even work longer working hours every day and in a week. Uh, but this makes it even more difficult for young couples to have their, uh, their establish their families and for women to both uh, be active in a job as well as uh, be active as a mother uh, with their uh, children. So the lesson we learn uh, from the, the European context is really that uh, what we call a work-life balance is very important. Uh, people want to have a fulfilled life uh, which includes, of course, a professional career and uh, uh, um, yeah, being part of the labor force and contributing, but it also includes a satisfactory private life, including family and children, and you need to have time for this. <laughs> and, and, and that's, for instance, like if you go to a, a Swedish company even there, there is no uh, meeting scheduled after 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So they try to put it, block it all in the in the morning and up to three, because then uh, both men and women should be allowed to go home, pick up their children from kindergarten and spend time with their family. And this turns out to be both productive for the economy, as well as leading to higher birth rates. Yeah, I'll often mention this to our HR department to not schedule <laughs> anything after three. Um, no, so I think turning to um, another kind of set of questions, since we are econ uh, we're a, a digital economy focused you know, research organization, um, you know, technology, uh, and particularly, you know, recently people have been starting to think about the potential for AI, uh, you know, in in our economy. Uh, you know, as as you probably know, for the last few decades, there's been a productivity paradox. People have wondered where productivity went. Um, you know, all this technology, all this digital technology we have doesn't seem to have increased technology. Some economists seem to think, um, you know, that we might finally see it with a lot of these advances in AI, because the goal of a lot of this AI is to replace general cognitive functions that we as humans kind of do. So I'm not sure if you've had a chance to think about, um, you know, going forward, you know, 10, 20 years, um, how much productivity we might gain from it, how this affects, you know, the slowing population in many countries. Yeah, well, in generally, uh, of course, uh, advances in technology and advances in AI in principle is nothing uh, different from an advance in technology. Um, can be uh, and have been historically replacing labor. It first started with the, uh, well, the, even the steam engine in, uh, in, in Britain helped to, to replace manual labor. And at the same time, of their people, while it got more productive, there also was an unemployment issue. The unskilled people couldn't find uh, jobs anymore because the machines were taking away those jobs. So, and our societies have reacted with upgrading the skills of people, always to the level that uh, uh, people then were still useful and productive at levels where uh, the, the machines couldn't do their jobs yet. So what we are seeing now through the uh, general uh, sort of the digital revolution and in particular also the artificial intelligence, then more and more office jobs are also made redundant. Some of the what people used to do at uh, the counter at the bank, what they've been doing there, this is more and more taken over by online banking and by automated programs. So the uh, the questions of the skill level at which people can be replaced by machines have been shifting up higher and higher. So what is the, uh, there are two uh, strategies uh, uh, to cope with this and to uh, convert this into benefits for society rather than in, into threats for society is of the, on the one hand, still try to upgrade the skills of people. Even for in the context of broad-based artificial intelligence, you still, uh, need uh, people who program these machines. You still need people who control them to not do things that we don't want to happen. So, But these uh, people need higher and higher skills in order to be able to, to cope and control uh, these computers. So that's the one way. And the other is look at the um, 
equity within the society and make sure that the gains that we have from these new and very powerful technologies benefit everybody in society. So it's not only certain segments who get richer through this, but also that the people who possibly lose their jobs uh, due to these new technologies, uh, they also get other things to do. I mean, there's an unlimited amount of work that you could possibly do, uh, let's say, in the cultural field, that you could do in interpersonal communications, consulting, or also care, uh, people, their bodily care, massage, or whatever enhances yeah. the quality of life of people, uh, but is usually not counted as, as very productive in a conventional way. So we really have to develop what I would call the well-being industry. After all, the goal is uh, to have uh, people uh, enhance the well-being of broad segments of the population. So here you have to I have this dual strategy, uh, and this also comes in line with, I said before, people should have more free time to also enjoy their family life and also look after things that are important for their lives and not only work for the economic productivity. So these both more skills to get more, together with more emphasis on, on the well-being uh, could possibly uh, make sure that these uh, advances in our uh, yeah, artificial intelligence and other technologies are to the benefit of society. Sure. Uh, do, do you have a view towards uh, how fast this will evolve? Uh, because it, again, it seems like just you know some years ago, people are worried about not enough workers. Um, and now we have some people starting to worry. I'm not sure if you know um, another Austrian named uh, Anton Korenek. Yes, uh, I've heard of him. And he, he came on recently. Um, you know, He's a fellow of the Lohan Academy to say that he's worried that people will need, all need a basic income going forward, or our many, many people will need a basic income. So it seems like we, we have these two very polar opposite views. Yeah. And I'm not sure if you personally have a view yeah. towards where we are 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Yeah, well, I mean, this basic income is a very interesting uh, debate. My personal view is that uh, uh, people uh, not only need an income, to survive, but they also need a meaning in their lives. Mm. So, and and of course, these days, uh, uh, making a contribution to society through your work also gives you meaning in your life. So, I don't think people just want to be uh, having sort of a free time all day around and and uh, just uh, consuming, but they also want to contribute something meaningful. So, I think there is. Uh, a need uh, in society uh, of the one hand of course make sure that nobody uh, falls through to to poverty levels of course everybody should be uh, brought up and there are many even young people who are for various reasons not able to productively work of course the government needs to help them they should all have at least a minimum level of uh, of consumption should be assured. But on top of that, I think the government also need to look for people to have meaningful activities in their lives that make you want to be active members of your society and contribute to this. And this uh, implies also paying for some activities that currently are unpaid activities, like looking after elderly, uh, making sure your environment is clean, having uh, meetings in your house community. And so there are needs to be, we think of uh, sort of uh, rewarding some of the work that is very important under a social dimension, uh, but has not yet been recognized economically so far. Okay, we all hope that's the case. Um, although one of our economists has a scenario where she proposed that maybe in the future, governments will need to create a game where people need to play the game to earn money or something. I, I hope we don't go to that, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I, I guess one um, sort of um, last kind of thought is um, how, how do you think, uh, you know, people should, should think about, um, it, it, you know, it, I'm sorry, I, I guess the way to put it is, uh, how, you know, th there's a lot of different news coming out about, um, uh, you know, demographics and, you know, policies kind of aimed to to deal with it. Uh, how do you think, you know, the, the average kind of person should, you know, think about their role in society yeah. and their role in, 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 in this demographic change? Yeah, it, it, this is uh, something uh, that I always find that um, demographic trends are, uh, 
always viewed in a very emotional and typically in a rather dramatic way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there has all been this writing about the population explosion and the population bump with respect to population growth. Now people start talking about the aging tsunami and the depopulation of this, with respect to the shrinking, always a lot of threatening uh, future scenarios. And I think we need to view uh, in a way what we are experiencing, the fact that uh, people are living longer and longer. This is one of the greatest achievements of humanity. I mean, we always wanted to avoid premature death. And now finally we succeed largely on this, despite all the setbacks with, with COVID and uh, uh, some problems uh, we have in some parts of the world. But overall, we are still on an improving trajectory. And also that now, Finally, people, uh, couples, and in particular women, can choose freely how many children they want to have. And this is also an, an achievement of human civilization. So together, uh, they result in some structural changes of our society, but we have means of coping with them. And also in terms of uh, overall world population, I think we are now probably seeing the end of world population growth in the uh, second half of this century, where we'll reach a peak, uh, more or less 10 billion people, and then we'll likely see a decline in world population. But this is also something that ecologists have been hoped for long. And if we extend our population projections even to the year 2200, of course, this is very far into the future. And we don't know what the world will look like then. But if sort of all countries in the world converge to having a level of fertility that we have in Europe these days, then the world population might decline to three to four billion people by 2200. And these are likely to be well-educated and, and healthy people who will also be able to cope better uh, with the already unavoidable consequences of climate change and other environmental threats. So this is a rather optimistic scenario uh, of the future. Uh, this is not assured, uh, but it's at least uh, possible. And if we make the right investments today, particularly investments in education and skills uh, that also have these beneficial consequences for health and uh, coping with environmental challenges, uh, then we can see a quite good future for humanity. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Professor Lutz. That's a great optimistic view to end on. I, we, we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Goodbye.